guys, welcome back to Strong Successful Mail. So for today, do an update or a continuation of the story I covered last week, which was titled, After my good wife passed, the gold diggers and Tinderellas were relentless, but they didn't get my money. And guys, that's all about the guy. He was six, He's 64 years old, <clears throat> and he's sharing his story about his life, things he's learned along the way, and how he ended up having a great first wife, great marriage, but unfortunately, she passed away relatively young, and then he was back into the dating scene after decades of not you know, being a part of that, and saw the train wreck that it was, and how literally his wife wasn't gone that long, and all of a sudden all the gold diggers and Tinderellas were after him, gals on Facebook, he even tried Tinder, which is nuts, and he knows it's a cesspool, and all that, but eventually he then meets a gal and takes his time at who becomes his next wife. And he's got uh, another great thing going, which shows this guy obviously knows how to, he knows how to what to look for in the gals and all that. And things are going well for him, and I'm happy. And he's continuing on here his story. Lots of very important life lessons he's learned along the way to help you, you guys out in various stages of your lives. Because as much as I love doing good, entertaining stories here that we all think are hilarious and all that, I also really want to help guys learn things to help improve their lives, hence becoming yourselves a strong, successful male. So, this guy's going to go through more things he's learned along the way that I, a lot of things I agree with, and I thought it'd be worth the time sharing with you guys, as well as, and also, he took the time to write this, so I certainly want to share his, uh, you know, make use of what he put his uh, effort into. So, it's definitely a good one, guys, and uh, kick back, and you're definitely going to learn something at the end of this video. So he says, uh, hey, SSM, thanks again for posting my story and the lessons learned along the way. I hope they help my fellow travelers, both men and women, nav navigate this bullshit called life. It is amazing how bad it's gotten since I was in my 20s, and these guys and gals, let's face it, the advice you give can help anyone. To recap, I'm the one who lost my first wife, learned all about dating all over again, and found another amazing wife. As bad, a dating, as bad as dating was when I was in my 20s, it's insufferable now. Yep. I'm writing to include a few more things I've learned and were taught to me along the way. I believe knowledge and experience are wasted unless it is shared and used. I hope it helps you out and all, all you out there. <clears throat> as you all know from my previous post, I had and survived cancer. I'd like to talk a little more about that. This part's good because at some point, as we all age... Things are going to happen to all of us. And since this, what he's about to say is something that can start happening to guys in their late 40s or 50s, I was definitely paying attention to this next part. He says here, I had prostate cancer. I was 49 when, when during a routine checkup, the nurse practitioner decided on a whim, no less, to schedule a PSA test in addition to the usual tests. Well, they came back elevated. A course of really nasty antibiotics, another test, still elevated. We scheduled a, pr a prostate biopsy. The results are positive. We get a recommendation. Neither the wife and I are happy about it. I get a second opinion. Sur schedule the surgery. The surgery is a big success. I rehab and heal, and I'm back to my normal self. And he says, and yes, I know what you're thinking. Everything works just fine, you dirty bastards. <laughs> I learned plenty during this time. Uh, first, once you get the test results back, you change. You feel and become different. You're going to have bad days. Take those days one at a time and remind yourself you are one step close to recovery. Yes, that's a theme for life. One step closer always to your grand goals. Do everything you can to keep a normal routine because your goal is to feel normal and to be made whole again. You're going to be out of work for a few weeks, so tell your boss, his boss, and your coworkers affected directly. There's no shame here. <clears throat> tell them your treatment. Tell them your treatment and how long they will be and your prognosis. Uh, this stays off. This stays off the rumor mill, which always runs wild. Make sure you let it be known you are maintaining a normal schedule and they are to treat you normally like they did every day. More onto this later. People will hear the word cancer and you are viewed as weak and feeble and you are already dead and buried. So make sure you kill the rumor mill. Yes, people, gossip, gossip, gossip. I got into a car accident when I was 18. Some jackass was racing and hit me. I was going up a hill and he was coming down a hill, racing some guy, two cars in each lane, that type of deal. And I saw at the last second I was able to swerve off, but I still got nicked. And that guy got really effed up. And everybody blamed me. The rumor went around high school like it was my fault. It's like these two assholes were racing one car in each lane. 
and they were coming from the top of the hill and I was like this coming up and all of a sudden and I was able to swerve off it still got nicked and they blamed me and then the other rumors were like I lost an eye and all these things it's amazing how rumors spread people are people <clears throat> says here, for those of you who are supporting a cancer patient, it is important to let them know you support them and are in their corner. Just tell them I'm here for you. Just let them, let me know if you need anything. It does wonders for your morale. Well, morale is everything. Also, and this is important, make sure you treat them normally. Being normal, feeling normal is what you crave because you don't want to feel, because you don't want to feel not normal. Pity is the worst thing that can inflict on a cancer patient. Pity means you are helpless. You are less than. You are pathetic. Treating the normal like you did every other day of the week is important to their recovery. It means they are your equal and they are capable. If they want to want, if they want to listen quietly, show empathy, show support, but never pity. I know this is counterintuitive, but just do it. Be positive and put on a happy face. If you need to cry or feel sad, do it without them. Yeah, I agree with all that. Treat them. Treat them. Exactly the same as you always do, and if you gotta if you gotta break down and cry, do it someplace else. <clears throat> as a cancer survivor, join a support group. There are a few good ones on Facebook and other places. I belong to one, and I'm very active on it. We are there to show you that there is life after cancer. Support others and share your story. It is a great therapy. After my recovery, I was asked to give talks to others suffering from prostate cancer. One of the best things I ever did. I gave monthly talks about my experiences and to, and to help ease men and their spouses about what life is like after prostate cancer. It says, spoiler alert, it is damn good. Your spouse can help in your recovery, and it's a lot of fun. Well, bro, that's great that you're giving back. I mean, that, that's awesome. I'm so glad you were doing that. I guarantee is that more than a few people listening to this right now have survived cancer. And we'll get it one day. I talked about things I would never dream of to total strangers, namely my pecker. But it made me then realize this is a fight you can win and you can live your life to its best. Remember, though, this is a hard fight. You're going to have to get mean and nasty, as mean and nasty as you've ever been, to take back what has been taken from you. You're going to have bad days and good ones, but you can do this. Follow your doctor's orders for recovery and follow your rehab to the letter. Put in the work, but don't overdo it You will, or you will backslide. As many of you may remember from my first story, I talked about my first wife's ring. He's jumping around here with lots of life, life lessons here. It was everything to her, and her final request was to wear it. Let's talk about the ring. The ring, your spouse's engagement and wedding rings, are a bellwether and a canary in the coal mine as to how she views your marriage, and by extension you. If she treats them like a trophy, guess what? You are a trophy and a status symbol. If she treats them like just another piece of junk jewelry, well, that's how she views you. If she looks at it and demands a bigger stone, guess what? You are a walking ATM. My first wife treated it like it was the most important thing in her life. Nobody could even touch those rings, much less wear them. She had an extensive collection of jewelry that she asked that I give to the nieces and nephews, all except for her rings. Nobody could have those. Granted, she was a little extreme, but the rings reflect how she sees your marriage. I gave my current wife a beautiful ring, but she only wears it on special occasions where she is acting in a professional manner for her new company because A, she runs a cl cleaning business and doesn't wear jewelry for safety reasons, and B, in Brazil, if you, if you don't want to end up with nine fingers, you avoid flashy bling in your day-to-day -day travels. So take personal and cultural history in mind. He says his wife's from Brazil. He's from the States. My father taught me that the more things you, the more you try things, the more you do things. The more mistakes and errors you will make. Accountability is important, and you need to own up to your own errors. Correct them, learn from them, and not repeat them. And I will say again, forgetting to carry the two when you're adding up an expense report is a mistake. Nailing a carousel rider you met at the local chew and screw is a choice and a very bad one. But learn from your experiences and take something positive from your experiences, even the bad ones. Exactly. There's always a lesson to be learned. You can screw up royally. And believe me, I've screwed up royally throughout my life. And I do my best to always learn and not make those mistakes again. So guys, don't beat yourself up too much if you make a mistake or you recently made a mistake. Learn from it and maybe share that wisdom with others who listen and move on. He also made it known that the biggest failure is the failure of effort. If you go, if you go, go all in. You make your decisions, you make them with reason and care. But once you commit, you are all in or not at all. Look forward and don't look back. Always do your best, whether it's in your work or waxing your car. Do the best job you have and pride in your efforts and never give up on yourself. 
Amen. Seems like nobody has pride in their work anymore. Or pride in themselves. You go out anywhere, people have let themselves go. They look like freaking slobs, how they dress, how they let their bodies go, all these things. It's, it's an absolute disgrace. On the, and then uh, then look at people in the workplace. I've, I've had hired people for, to do jobs for me or my house or back when I had a condo. And you had some great people and other ones that were owners of businesses that did piss poor jobs. And they were immediately fired and I got good people. But it's one thing to have employees do bad jobs, but the owners, right? Yeah. Take pride in what you do and, and put everything, put all your effort into it. It will be rewarded in time. Uh, the next bit of advice and life lesson came from my mother. Always, and I mean always, walk away from a bad deal. It doesn't matter if it's in real estate, family, a financial deal, personal, romantic, whatever. If it's a bad deal, you walk away. Have that line in your head, and if it gets crossed, you get up and say, okay, we are done. And that is it. You walk and not look back. I had two uncles I never knew. I wouldn't even know what they look like. My mother never talked about them, and she never went to their funerals or gave them a minute's thought. I later found out why. I agree with all that. After their father died and my mother contracted polio, the family was in disarray. My grandma recovered well and lived another 50 years. Her dear brother decided it would be a good idea to get my mom married off to a friend of theirs. She was 16 at the time. She ended up living with her oldest sister and husband, who became the de facto grandmother and grandfather. When she married my father two and a half years later, she received the most vile, offensive letter from her dear brothers, and after that, she was done. I found the letter after she passed away, and, it, and if they were still alive at that time, I think I personally would have tracked them down and beat them into a hamburger. Yeah, it was that vile. But yeah, you learn to walk away. The first time you do it, it is hard, almost traumatic. But by the third time you do it, it's easy as trying as tying your shoes. Guys, I've been saying since day one. Girlfriends, wives, friends, acquaintances, business associates, family even. They cross a line with you, that, that, that boundary that, that should never be crossed. You walk away, have nothing to do with them, even if it's family. Absolutely. Because otherwise they'll continue taking advantage of you. And I'll buy into that. It's family crap. No. I got family I'm close with, and I got family I have nothing to fucking do with. I got a cousin I haven't talked to since 1996. And we were best friends because he crossed the line. Series of crossing the line. When I was 18, that was it. And I might add, he went off to prison for a number of years. So it's good I cut contacts with him. Yeah. I got another cousin, a, a, a gal, who is the most far left nut job you will ever fucking meet. Annoying is all hell. And of course knows everything. I got nothing to do with her either. You know, if she was a nice person, we could d totally disagree on politics, but she's not. I got nothing to do with her. Anyway, he says, this leads me to another lesson. Family is overrated. What I just say. Hiding behind family is just a way to manipulate you into becoming a doormat. Do not buckle. Do not capitulate. Be prepared to walk away if it's intolerable. Preserve your mental health. Remember, some of the worst atrocities have occurred between blood relatives. So this is, but, but this, but we are family is total and utter BS. If somebody insists on you, you're doing something that you disagree, tell them that if it's so important to them, they should do it. See the previous lesson for the proper remedy. Family is what you define it to be. That family is all important to you, and you guard and protect that family at all costs. I agree with all that, if they're good to you. And guys, out for all you guys out there that are really trying to make something yourselves in this world, <clears throat> move up, make a lot of money, remember something about family. You're going to have family that won't lift a finger to do anything to help themselves, but if you're doing well, A, they're going to hate on you and be jealous of you. Some of you may know what I'm talking about here. And also, they're going to be coming to you for a loan. And you better be prepared to say no freaking way. Why would you grind and grind and grind and sacrifice your time and fun time and money you could spend on vacations to take that money to invest and grow it and you're doing well for yourself and then they go give it to somebody that did nothing for themselves, were lazy, pissed away their money on BS. You get the point. If somebody's truly in, in need and they're a nice person, that's one thing. But to some of these people that feel entitled to your money, you know, even though they've done nothing for themselves, and I might add they've hated on you your whole life because they're jealous of you. No. Nope. And don't buy that because they're family crap. Uh-uh. Some people will agree with me, but many probably will. Some people won't agree with me what I'm saying here, but I think a lot of you will if you look at the situation. <clears throat> he goes on. He says, uh, unconditional love is a myth. <laughs> the only unconditional love you're ever going to get, guys, is probably from your dog 
And, and me, like my cats, well, no, I don't got unconditional love for my cats. If I don't feed them, then they're going to they're gonna probably eat me. But it's, they're as close to unconditional love. Those little monsters are amazing. But anyhow, your dog will get unconditional love. Maybe your mama might give you, maybe, you know. No such thing. When a woman says, I want a man to love me unconditionally, all I hear is, I want a doormat who will put up with all my bullshit no matter what. Yep. Everything has a condition, including love. You break those conditions, love is gone. Granted, parents generally have a much higher threshold for those conditions, but I know very well if I crossed that line with my mom, that would have been it. So set your conditions and carve them into granite. Don't take the blue pills. Women like security, women like strength. Being a strong RP man doesn't mean you have to be a dick. Yes, exactly. In fact, it means you're actually not a dick. It means you have standards and ethics. You're strong, capable, and self-sufficient. You have standards and a way of living of which you will not deviate. And ethics is what you do when you are alone, nobody's watching you, have them. Yeah, I've been saying all the time, guys, you don't have to be like Chad and Tyrone. You can learn some things that Chad and Tyrone do, but you don't have to be an a-hole like that. You stand up for yourself, you have your code, and nobody's going to fucking cross that. You know, and anybody, men, women, anybody that do you wrong, you check them, of course, and you decide whether they're going to stay in your life or not. End of story. And you do what you want to do and you put yourself first. You, you, again, you're not a a-hole about it, but I think you all get my point. Uh, there is no privacy in marriage, period. If a part of the house is off limits, big red flag. If her phone or any of her other personal devices is off limits, big red flag. If you catch her with stuff on her phone that ought not to be there and she says, you violated my privacy, your only response is, there is no privacy in marriage, cupcake, none. My wife and I are open books to each other. We share stuff on each other's phones constantly. She goes out to show her friends every few months and I meet up, with, up for dinner with some of my shooting buddies every six to eight weeks or so as well. Yeah, she, I think you said in your first story, she comes along with you to the, the rifle range or whatever, or the gun club. Cool. Personally, I think it's fucking sexy seeing a chick squeezing off some rounds, but that's just me. One of my, I become friends with my electrician, and he's been inviting me to join him at the gun club and get myself the, uh, I have to go through the process to get the conceal type of deal down here in Florida, and may all be some chicks there. That'd be cool. Of course. I will be careful, of course. We ask if it's okay, and then we tell each other where we are going, who we're with, and when we expect to leave. We text each other we are leaving and get and get and to get our boyfriend girlfriend out of the house. It's a running joke we have and share our maps. We do it for transparency and safety reasons. If anything happens we will know. Uh, when I when I hunted I would leave a copy of a map where I would be parked and coordinates where I would be and about uh, when I expected to be leaving the area. Many of those places had no cell service so again safety's sake. That's a good idea. If you suffer a trauma, like your spouse cheating or dying, you have to find a normal you can live with. Movement is important. Many of you say hit the gym. Well, what if you don't like gyms or gym rats? Well, walk and take up running. Buy a home, gym, learn... I can't read what he wrote here. Anything to get your butt moving. Find out, find or rekindle hobbies. Learn to cook. Eating out is expensive, and prepared packaged foods is like eating plastic. Even if you make simple things, eating your own food is better for you. Yeah, guys, I always tell you, live beneath your means. One of the quickest way to piss away money is going out to eat all the time. You can do it sometimes as a treat. Learn to cook your own food. You'll save a. F you're, you're watching me on YouTube. You can look up videos how to make the most basic things. You'll save a fortune, and you live beneath your means. So every every month you have extra money that you can put away and invest in assets that will appreciate in value over time. That that is how you build wealth, guys. And as for the gym, okay, you may not like the gym, and you may not like gym people there, so you can get your own home gym, your basic dumbbell set, and do basics. Shit, you could do three days a week. You can do for 10 to 15 minutes, three or four sets of squats with your own body weight, push-ups, and crunches. <clears throat> we did some martial arts all the time. 20 squats, 20 push-ups, 20 crunches, repeat. Three to four sets. That, six months of that and eating well, you'll be amazed how you look after six months. Now, if you're morbidly obese, it's going to take a lot fucking longer than that. But if you're 25 pounds overweight, you know, good eating and doing that will certainly help you. But you always keep moving, walking, anything, flying a kite, bouncing down the street on a goddamn pogo stick, anything. Keep yourself moving always. 
<clears throat> I love to cook and I'm damn good at it. But when it's just me, my menus reduce drastically. But I still cook. Remember when I said I like beans? Well, I make them now. Cheap and easy, and I freeze big batches and have home cooked food, and that's better than anything prepared. Regardless of whether you want to serve gourmet foods or just something you can shovel in your face, learn to cook for yourself. Besides, women love men who can cook. Yep, darn right about that. Learn about seasonings and spices, guys, if you guys want to cook. Good seasonings and good spices can make a fucking piece of cat shit taste good. Uh, music is your friend, but avoid worthless pity songs. Songs like Don't You Want Me or Here I Go Again by White Snakes are bullshit pity songs, and the last thing you need is pity. Listen to stuff that either gets you in a good mood or exercises the rage inside you. Listen to Power Rage or High Voltage by ACDC or Pretty Hate Machine or Broken by Nine Inch Nails to get you a really your blood going. Just stay away from the woes me shit. ACDC is one of my favorite fucking bands. ACDC, Metallica, yeah, that's my type of thing. But I'm, I'm into fucking, you know, metal. Cheaters never cheat downwardly. They seek their own level. If they're cheating with trash, then you know who they really are. Sometimes they try to trade up, but really and truly, they generally seek their actual level. If they say, I normally don't do this, but you're special, remember this. The reality is, they normally do, and you are not. Do you know how many girls I've had over the years that have said to me, and I'm sure this has happened to a lot of you guys, I never do this. Yeah, uh-huh. I had this gal. <laughs> I was 21 years old. She was a co-worker. I learned then not to date your co-workers. I'll date my fucking co-worker. And the first time we got frisky, and immediately she was going down to Chinatown. And before she proceeded to service me in that way, had to look up and say, I normally never do this. And it's like, really? Uh, mm-hmm, okay. And she proceeds to do her thing. And let me tell you, for a gal who claims she never, ever does this, she did it like a fucking pro. So, yeah, right there. I never do this. Bullshit. Uh, <clears throat> cheaters are never, ever sorry for cheating. You're darn right about that. They're sorry they got caught. They're sorry their dirty little secret has been exposed. They're sorry you now know just uh, how they really feel about you. Just reading their texts, odds are the cheater and their APs are making jokes about you and saying some pretty nasty things. They're just sorry their secrets have been exposed and the veil of respectability has been lifted. Never do the pick-me dance. If your relationship is starting to feel like an episode of Let's Make a Deal, walk. Relationships are not competition and odds are, aren't Aren't, you're, you're not going to win. Even if you do win, you will eventually lose as more contestants play. When it's clear she's holding a cattle auction, just say, thanks for your time, I wish you the best in your future endeavors, and away you go. Correct. She'll be pissed off, try to convince you otherwise, and generally act insulted, but that is all bullshit. She's just pissed you bagged her. If you really want to see an explosion, call her out on her crap. Write it down and recite it back chapter and verse. It will go from tears to rage to tears and back to rage. Think of it as an emotional... I can't think of the word. I can't pronounce the word he just wrote there, but I get your point. Always remember relationships take work, but it is good work. Pleasant work, works that are rewarding. Well, if it's with the right gal, let's keep that in mind. In a positive, beneficial relationship, you will get out and what you put into it. In a bad relationship, the work is bad. The effort is taxing and you will feel consumed in negative energy. It doesn't feed you, it stars you. If you feel constantly stressed, feel drained, every day is an unpleasant challenge, you need to make changes, it will consume you. I agree with all that, but you, but it has to be, to make it work, it has to be with the right gal. If you're a giver and she's a fucking taker, then it's not going to work. She's got to be equally a giver and loving and supportive and loyal and all these positive qualities. Uh, one from my wife. Always have pride in your work, in yourself, and be the best. When she came here to America, her English was limited and she had trouble finding work. She started a cleaning business and started with one house. She said, if this is what I have to do, I will be the best. Today, she put her son through college. Last, last semester coming. Has 30 houses and two doctor's clinics and two crews. She's looking to sell it off and start a new venture. I help her all I can and run her books and manage expenses. Good for her. That is awesome. That's how it goes, guys. You start off with one thing. When I started personal training, I took three clients from my previous business, that the job, the gym I worked at, three clients. And then that grew and grew and grew because I knew at first I wasn't going to be making a whole lot of money, but I had money, plenty of money saved away. Three clients to start personal training, did the best I could do. I got recommendations and I did advertising and got more and more people. Told book solid. 
good for her. But a lot of people nowadays just want everything dropped in their lap and everything working out perfect immediately because we have an instant gratification society. Then they quit. That's awesome about your wife. I asked her what she thought about American women. Oh, boy. She replied, young American women are beautiful, just beautiful. They have access to the best of everything, but don't take advantage of it. They don't take care of themselves. They don't take care of their skin, their hair, their face, or their body. They have the best life, but they are never happy. Well, looking around a lot, don't take care of them. They'll take care of themselves if they can take a picture of it and put it on Instagram. And then they use the touching up features to make... You can always tell when you're on Instagram... When people use those features to like touch themselves up. I had some clients back in the day, these gals, they were twin sisters from a very wealthy family. And they take and they were sevens. They're young, they're mid-20s, they were sevens. They look like nines when they were younger, but they put on weight. They're spoiled. And the one twin I like better than the other. And they and they would take pictures and put on Instagram because I was connected them with my personal training Instagram at the time. And it's like, you don't look like that. And you can see all the touch-ups they do on Instagram. and all. I'm, I'm going off. I'm in the mood to talk. But yes, American women and Americans in general don't take advantage of what they really have. The American women, they seek drama and stress. Yep, they can be spoiled, entitled, lazy, and selfish. <laughs> can be. Good Latin women, he said, good Latin women, who come from good families or who are educated and hardworking will put their man first. Will put their men first. Only, I'm, I'm going to say only if they uh, respect their men. They give their men the best food, the best care, the best house. A good man will turn turn, turn share the best with that, the family, but it is to his to share. If you meet a Latin woman, remember one thing. Good Latin women come from good families, are not carousel writers. Quite the opposite. They have high standards. Most Latin women dress very, very minimally because it is so bloody hot that everyone just wears the minimum to avoid a heat stroke. To them, it's just something they do. I can tell you, if you want hot, visit Brazil in November, and this is coming from somebody who lives in the Gulf Coast. Thinking and approaching her as if she is a carousel rider is the worst insult you can throw her way. You may end up losing a body part. But Latin carousel riders do exist, and the missus has one word for them. Trash. That's exactly what they are. Trash. Mrs. C is a hard ass and doesn't mince her words. So he's talking about Latin women from Latin America. He's not talking about American gals that are here in fucking Miami that are Latina, but they're American girls. She's talking about the ones from, from the old country. And she's making it clear, yes, you got carousel riders, but good traditional families, and that's different. So I hope that's the case. Another one, he says, information is your most valuable asset. Oh, you're right about that. Wall Street. Gordon Gecko said to Bud Fox, the most valuable commodity I know of is information. I learned some very valuable information this weekend that's going to help me financially down the road. Something with my family. The ability to gather, catalog, store, and process information is a cornerstone to your success. All information is valuable. Every scrap you observe will eventually be useful. They called me Mr. Documentation when I worked, and I think they might be have been making fun of me, but they helped fuel my professional success. Share information freely, unless it's some secret recipe that your entire business runs on, like Coca-Cola or some barbecue sauce. Information is useless unless it's shared, used, and improved upon. Information is wasted if it dies with the, process, the possessor. It says to be successful, you don't need to be the smartest, you most, the most creative, or, or some kind of genius. You do have to, to have a way to store and process information. And, this is very important, be able to cut to outwork everyone else. Hard work and, intellig and intelligent effort will overcome any deficiency, real or perceived, you have. Now understand the difference between hard work and burning yourself out. Don't destroy yourself working uh, because you will only harm yourself and in 20 years it won't matter one bit. Produce, do your best, but do not work yourself into a pile of dust for a paycheck. You'll know when you cross the line, so make sure you take corrective actions before your physical and mental health takes a dive. You're no good to your family if you are too, are too sick to work. Yeah, exactly. This is why it's so important that young guys understand. Bust your tail when you're young, when you have the energy to establish yourself. Sit, live beneath your means. Save your Invest as early as possible in, in assets that will appreciate in value over time. And let that grow so that when you're older and you're tired and don't have the energy, physically or mental, to work as much, you got a lot of wealth built up that you can then scale back. 
you know, or you, you start a new business and you bust your ass for a number of years, you're working fucking 70, 80 hours a week, and then eventually you can scale back and benefit from the fruits of your labor, you know, I used to work seven days a week constantly, I don't do that anymore, I do now do work six days a week, you know, I give myself one day, I'm not doing anything aside, I'll have videos filmed and stored, and I'll just click publish, and the videos will come off and, and so forth, that's it, I take at least one day off to myself. The day will come, I'll eventually take two days off for myself and maybe scale back from working while I work now. I typically, on an easy week, the easiest fucking week I do, I might do 60 hours and it can go 75. You know, there's a lot more than just filming, guys. There's reading stories and articles and all that behind the scenes and other ventures I'm doing. But eventually, I'm, I don't want to burn myself out. And he's right. But I will be working prior to the day I die if it's a business of mine because I love it. It says, have a plan for your retirement. Yes. No, I'm not talking about a financial plan, though you should already have one one of those. If you don't yet, SSM, uh, give them a good a general slap. What I'm talking about is what you're going to do every day when you go from committing 12 to 14 hours a day to getting ready for, going to, and from, and actually working to nothing. Too many people backslide and regress. Think about things you want to do. Me, I do my own landscaping. I set up a rose garden, grow vegetables. I shoot sporting clays two to three times a week. Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, my uncle, when he retired, my godfather, when he retired at like, I think 62, because he was like a buyout offer, he, one of those things that he got to retire a little bit early, he didn't do anything. He just watched football and Law and & Order and, you know, didn't do a whole lot. And I could see it wearing him down. He, he, he hung out with family and everything, but just, it wasn't the same after that. And a lot of people really get worn down. Yeah, I agree with that. It says, I bought a classic Land Rover at 90 and work on that. Fun fact, having a classic car is like having a side piece. Like a side piece, they consume large amounts of your money and are high maintenance and are, and are fun. They are, however, better than a side piece because your wife won't mind when she sees you underneath one. She'll even enjoy going to for a ride with you. I eventually bought another old Land Rover and work on that as well. The bottom line is that you have to have an idea of life without work or you will wither on the vine. Enjoy the next phase of your life. Another one. Feminism. Feminism is a fake construct. It's not for equality. It's to make us all the same. We are not the same. But for some reason, this is what feminists are trying to do. Boys are boys and girls are girls. The only way to do that is to neuter and geld the boys. Toxic masculinity, the patriarchy, what a load of horseshit. That toxic masculinity is what fought wars, hunted for food, protected the family. You need a large tree cut down in your yard. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? Some man, some man bun wearing soy boy or some alpha type male who runs a saw like it's part of his hand. Exactly. You don't have to be an a-hole, but you need traditional masculinity. That's why it's so important. Have boy, bo let boys be boys. They're going to be fucking rascals, but they know they're going to be in deep shit to cross the line. Have boys in training in martial arts or some kind of self-defense thing so they can learn not only how to defend themselves, but self-discipline, which is that key. And all the other things. And let girls be let girls play with their Barbies and wear pinks and purples and stuff like that and, and be fucking girls, you know? Everything's all out of whack. The family, it, we're different. End of story. There's nothing wrong with that. Anyway, another one. He says, if you want to go visit South America, here are a few tips. Rio is an amazing place. It's fun and the ladies are beautiful. However, South America in general and Rio in particular can get pretty rough. You can get into deep shit if you do the wrong things. Rio is a tour tourist destination and the locals know it. I hope I don't have to explain what that means. First, don't stand out. Don't be the ugly American. Be discreet, low-key, and polite. It goes a long way. Second, don't wear fancy or sparkle jewelry. It's a good way to end up with nine fingers and be called stumpy. Violent crime is a reality in South America. Wear a simple wedding ring, simple accessories, and for a wristwatch, leave the Rolex or Omega at home. Yeah, it's like a big sign. Rob me. I bought a used Psycho on eBay for 50 bucks. It works fine, and if anything happens to it, well, no big loss. Bring little or no cash. Nobody uses it. Everything is done via plastic. Get a wallet that is designed to be worn in the front pocket. Wearing a wallet in the back or vest pocket is pretty much guarantees it will be go missing. Get a cheap or burner phone to take with you and get a local SIM card or buy a phone there. For the same reason, I use my previous model phone with a Brazilian-based SIM card. I always, if I'm, if I'm in the city, walking around, or back in Boston when I was riding, uh, when I was riding the subway, the T, I always kept my wallet in my front pocket and my hand in there guarding it. 
Nothing ever happened, of course, but you know, you know what, know what I mean. But this is a lot of fucking work you got to put in to go to Brazil, dude. I don't, I don't know if I want to go to Brazil if I got to do all this shit. Uh, same goes for your earbuds. Never, never leave the AirPods or, or Bose earphones at home and get some decent cheapies that you don't mind losing. Never, ever wear them in public. There's a thing called situational awareness, and while it's always good to employ in your everyday life as a stranger in a strange land, it's doubtedly important you know your surroundings. Don't go off the beaten path, stay in the main and well-lit areas. Nowadays, no matter where you go, people are so distracted by their phones and their music and all that, they'll walk across the fucking highway and get hit and be like, oops, I didn't know that truck was coming. Situational awareness, guys. The first lesson I learned in martial arts from the, the, the owner was mind your surroundings. Because I people were coming at me with punches and I fucking backed into the wall and knocked shit over. <laughs> mind your surroundings. Anywhere. Lastly, live your best life. Always try to do the right thing, but never become a white knight or doormat because that is is not the right thing to do. Getting fucked over is not the right thing. Losing your mental or physical health is not the right thing. Caregiving your devoted parent, wife, or husband is the right thing, and yes, it takes a toll on you. But trying to save some nut job... <laughs> I can't say the word he said here. Some nut job is a wasted effort will only suck the life out of you. Never get involved with broken, mentally or emotionally unstable people or ones who stay close to bad, toxic family despite being a destructive thing to do. In other words, don't be a white knight. You cannot fix them. Even professionals often cannot. They will only damage you in the process. You are no good to anyone, including yourself, if you end up being damaged. If your potential mother-in-law is a psycho, move along. Unless your spouse is ready and able to totally cut ties or seem seem to side with the crazy, just go. The drama and, this, and the stress will is not worth it. Your life will turn into your own private hell in no time. I always tell you, pay attention to who her family is. I wish for everyone to have the success they desire and to be able to live their best life. Success is not a zero-sum game. Other successes is not a sign of your failure. Well, that is the end of his teachings and lifelong stuff, and this is great. I agree, you know, pretty much with everything there. Except I'm not going to go to Brazil because I can't wear anything out in Brazil getting fucking mugged and have my fingers chopped off or something. So I'll avoid Brazil and probably South America. I just can't take the... I'm in Florida. I I'm learning to deal with the heat. And I've been spoiled because I moved here in October. So the real heats are coming, coming in a few months. But anyhow, I think I might pass in that hot climate. But anyhow... Great, great thing, man. I appreciate you taking the time to write this. And this video is not going to be stellar. Not like the crazy stories, but that's okay. Because those that will watch this will learn something or reinforce things they already knew from the perspective of a guy in his 60s who's been around the block and learned a lot. And so I appreciate you taking the time to do that. So I'm glad round two of your life is going really well. I'm glad things are going with your wife. Again, remember everything you learned and employ those things. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your lives together. And if I hear from you down the road... Definitely, if you decide to write me down the road, let me put it this way. You write me down the road, updates or things going on, or a checkup, great. Love to hear from me. I'll do your video. All right, guys, that is it for today. Be sure to comment down below. Let me know what you think about this. Let this guy know what you think in the comment section. Give him a shout-out for taking the time to write these life lessons. We can all benefit from these. And be sure to like the video, share with your friends, and subscribe. And I'll catch you next time.